We travel through 2,500 years of history in search of the secret behind great power. And we found that empires were never built on brute force alone. And no empire started out as a great empire from its incarnation. The population of the Netherlands, which ruled the world's oceans in the 17th century, was just 2 million. There were less than 100,000 people in Genghis Khan's Mongolian tribe. How did these powers start out so weak, but go on to conquer the world? But there is no unified leadership, or there's incoherence, or there's stupidity then you, you have lots of potential to be great power, but you cannot operate as great power. Not like the British, who are very small, and we understand that. If you're small, you have, to, you have to either be clever or very quiet. Our understanding of empires, we think of them as different from nation states, in that they have different groups of population inside the polity. So a major challenge for empires is to come up with ways to manage these different social groups. Join leading scholars from around the world as they unlock the key to global influence. Great power is in a world of 190, 200 powers on this, this earth of ours, a no, small number of them are larger powers, and they are so large that we call them great powers. Remember that there are lots of medium-sized powers, and there's also a hundred or so very small nations, which are island powers. So great power is only we refer to top five or six or seven. Sometimes in Cold War, we just refer to two great powers, Soviet Union and United States. Great power we usually think of as having a, 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 a combination of big population, uh, lots of land, uh, economic technological development, uh, economic financial strength, and big military power. When you put them together, like uh, Great Britain in 19th century or United States today, we say those five elements, they are great power. A superpower is a state which is capable of exerting its influence across the known world, capable of fighting in more than one continental area, and is capable of controlling the sea communications between the areas it needs to operate in. In the 19th century, there is only one superpower, it's the British. That's not strength, that's the ability to operate globally. British are never very strong, they never have a great army. The last Englishman to conquer France um, died in 1420. You, the English never have military power like that. They use their sea power skillfully, to become a superpower. A superpower is a power that is able to project its force in a way that other states will follow its lead uh, without direct compulsion. A superpower is a state that is able to take advantage of a system of alliances uh, that does not need necessarily to have its own people on the ground to get its will, to work its will. Uh, a superpower is economically uh, superior to the other states around it, uh, and it's able to make use of that economic power efficiently. Well, uh, traditionally, a great power was a country that could prevail in a major war. So the famous Oxford historian A.J.P. Taylor, when he described great powers in Europe, 
said a great power was a country that could prevail in war. But that's very much a 19th century or 20th century definition of a great power. Uh, nowadays, a great power has to be able to do more than prevail in war. It also has to have uh, economic power and soft power, the ability to attract others. So in that sense, a great power today uh, is a country which has a large amount of military, economic, and soft power. Power is the ability to get the things you want, and you can do it three ways. You can do it by coercion, or by payment, or by attraction. It being able to get what you want without coercion or payment and just use attraction is soft power. And that grows out of a country's culture, uh, its values, and its policies when they're seen as legitimate in the eyes of others. So in that sense, a great power today uh, is a country which has a large amount of military, economic, and soft power. Thus, a great power is a nation with the authority to force other nations to act according to its will. And as Paul Kennedy said, this power has to be supported by physical factors such as large population, vast territory, developed technology, economic power, and military strength. However, if a great power were to rely simply on these physical strengths, it's certain to meet its downfall. This is because all great powers, by default, have to solve one great puzzle. All empires and all great powers face similar challenges. Now one of those is how to maintain rule over a long distance. That long distance could be over oceans, but it might be over land, or it might be both. And both in ancient times and today, uh, this problem of ruling at a distance is something that empires had to face. They also had to face, as I mentioned earlier, the problem of ruling over diverse peoples. So empires have to come up with a way to manage these different populations. And in our understanding of empires, we think of them as different from nation states in that they have different groups of population inside the polity. So a major challenge for empires is to come up with ways to manage these different social groups. People believe that Chinggis Khan and the Mongols only conquered. But the truth is, the Mongol army was very small, maybe a hundred thousand. The whole Mongolian nation was a million. And they were conquering countries of hundreds of millions of people. You don't conquer them by force. You have to attract people as well. You can't rule an empire that big purely by force. You haven't got enough soldiers. You never will have enough. So you need to persuade everybody that actually they want to be part of your empire. And that's, that's the greatest genius of the Romans, and it's why they are so successful for so very long. As the saying goes, you can conquer the heavens and earth on horseback, but you can't rule the heavens and earth on horseback. This is the dilemma that all empires and superpowers face. Military might can bring you world domination or hegemony, but hegemony cannot be maintained by hard power alone. Everyone understands that there are limitations to brute force. Hegemony cannot be maintained without clear agreement and spontaneous participation of the people under its rule. How then did the historical empires go about earning that agreement? Let's start out with Rome. The key element to being a successful superpower, I think, is the ability to understand that other people don't necessarily share your own interests, and that when you're going to take action, you find principles upon which to act that others can agree with. Um, for instance, uh, Rome 
would simply say, first of all, we are obligated by fides, by good faith, to go forward, and secondly, that we will share the benefits of victory uh, with our allies. The Roman Empire is the only empire, ultimately, where former subjects rule the empire. Um, the Romans make other people Roman citizens. They incorporate them into the power structure of their state. No other imperial society was as successful as Rome was at giving its subjects a vested interest in its survival and success. What is surprising is that whereas in the 20th century, people in India wanted to be Indian, they didn't want to be ruled by the British, um, people in African countries wanted to be themselves. For the Romans, that doesn't happen. Nobody wants to be a Gaul or a Briton or a Spaniard or a Syrian. They all want to be Roman. It has been there for so many hundred years and it has turned everybody into Romans. It doesn't remain as conqueror and subjects. What it does is you become Roman in this quite remarkable way that no one else has done. You know, it is not like, uh, think of a, of a particularly bad example, you know, the, the Japanese empire in the 20th century where everybody else they conquered was treated badly, very, very badly and cruelly and was never going to be able to change that. They would always be, they would be on top and they would have the profit, they would have the money, they would have the power and everyone would be a subject, would be a slave. The Romans have turned everybody into themselves in a way that is so, in that sense, they are one of the greatest superpowers ever. Paul is a perfect example of the kind of global citizen that you have at the time. He is by ethnics, he is Jewish. By education, he's Greek. He knows, that's why he can talk to, you know, he goes to all these places. Uh, he can talk to the Greeks and, and, and Ephesus and Athens and Corinth, whatever, in their own terms. He has that education. And by citizenship, he's a Roman. Mm. It's a perfect combination. Mm. And he's not the only one, mm, by any means. Mm. That is the kind of cosmopolitan mm. uh, citizenry that goes beyond this legal citizenship that, that is being established. And these are very influential people. And I'm not trying to say the Roman Empire was wonderful to everybody, or that's, that's, that's not the point. But, but certainly, what is, what is significant, what is important to realize is that the impetus doesn't just come from above. Okay, you do this. Certainly under Augustus and others, definitely not. It's laissez-faire in many ways. But these people from the ground up, they want to get into that system. Rome was incredibly open when it came to citizenship. Even slaves could become citizens eventually. The majority of household slaves were freed after 10 years of slavery. They became free people. And then, their children were automatically given citizenship of Rome. In varying degrees, such tolerance and openness to the others and the rule are common traits of all successful hegemonies. For a great power to exist today or in the past, they must be multi-ethnic, multi-racial, and multi-religious. The Roman Empire combined people of many different religions, of many different races, languages, all together. In the few times where we've had a country try to create an empire, such as 20th century Germany or 20th century Japan, based upon one country, one ethnicity, and one model, it has failed. When a country such as the Mongols or the Romans or the British base their system upon many different nationalities, many different religions, they succeeded. What does tolerance mean? It means that you uh, are not actively hostile to other religions or not hostile to other way of life or other culture or other belief systems. Yes, you have your own, your own uh, religion or your own way of life or your own democracy, etc. But you want to be tolerant of others and tolerance will help your strength. If you are intolerant, that is English word for your listeners, intolerant means you don't like other people. You don't like other religions. You don't like immigration, for example. In Middle East, intolerance is helping to weaken countries. 
if you are Shia uh, Muslim country and you are Sunni Muslim country and you are intolerant and you are fighting and you are very convinced that your, your religion should be the great one, the top one, that is intolerance. And does intolerance help you? No. It weakens you. It, it, it loses your strength. Genghis Khan, in conquering people, he did not try to change them into Mongols. In fact, uh, he assumed that they would keep their own religion. He didn't want them to know his language. His language was from Mongols. And so it became actually against the law for foreigners to speak the Mongolian language. So he kept his life and his law, but he allowed other people to live under their own law. And this was very unusual in the time because he allowed also for religious tolerance and religious freedom. Christians could be Christians, Buddhists could be Buddhist, the Confucianists, the Muslims, they could all keep their own religion as long as they obeyed the Mongol law. This attracted many people, especially minority religions would come and fight for Chinggis Khan, or in many cases, minority groups asked Chinggis Khan to come in. In his conquest of Western China, the Muslim people appealed to him because there was a Buddhist lord who was trying to impose Buddhism on the Muslims and they didn't want it. So many people asked Chinggis Khan to come in because he was known for his tolerance of all religion, all customs, all languages, and all laws. Late in his life, Chinggis Khan began a series of discussions with various religious leaders. He would call them to his camp, and at night they would sit around and they would talk about Islam or Taoism or Buddhism. And then after he died, his sons and grandsons carried on the tradition. In 1254, uh, William of Rupert became the first European to enter the city of Karakoram. He was amazed at how many different religions were there but he was quite upset when he was told that he had to participate in a religious debate. And in the first round of the debate, the Christians and the Muslims lost. The Taoists and the Buddhists were left for the championship. And so then William of Rupert, of course, was very disappointed and very embarrassed that they would lose. That is the kind of pattern that the Mongols set to go way back in history. They set a pattern by which the great Khan could recognize that people had different religions, Muslims, Christians, Jews, uh, or people had different ethnicities and different social groups. That was acceptable. And we see many empires that then express their recognition of difference in this way, and that is to say, people are unlike. And we are great because we are able to shelter all these unlike people and keep the peace among them. That's not necessarily a democratic way. That's not a statement about everybody being alike and having the same rights. But it is one aspect of an imperial politics based on difference. But even the most magnificent empires cannot avoid eventual decay and collapse. This happened to the global empire of the Mongols, and even to the most perfect empire, Rome. What then brings about decay in great powers? The problem begins when a nation becomes so powerful that it begins to disregard all other nations. We all need people to whom we have to answer. <laughs> I don't mean a boss, but I mean people who can hold us accountable. Um, you know, if you find yourself where you don't have to, you don't have to take anybody else into consideration, you can just do whatever you want. We don't do well. We we eat too much. Uh, we spend money wastefully. Uh, we try to dominate others. Uh, when it happens to individuals, we sort of go a little crazy, and it happens to countries too. Uh, when a country has no one that can hold it accountable, they go crazy too. That happened to Rome. It happened. Who make a long list of countries. If it makes stupid decisions, it will weaken itself. That is, that is a, a lesson of history. If, if a leader like Philip II of Spain, who is number one way back 400 years in the year 1600, if he has all of his strength 
and he makes stupid decisions. He goes to war against the Ottoman Turks. He goes to war against France. He goes to war against England. All at the same time, he is like Adolf Hitler. He makes stupid decisions and his country drops down. They borrowed too much money that they could not pay uh, to not just to run the government, but to run warfare. And warfare is the government expense that's impossible to control. And they did this with a country that ultimately is not very rich in resources. Those resources are population and agricultural wealth. And compared to France or Germany, Spain is poorer. So it's overextended in terms of the size of its empire. It's overextended in terms of its population and the ability of that population to support an empire that's that large. It's overextended in its military capacities. And like many countries, many periods of history, it gets huge amounts of money, which it then spends. And it spends more money than it gets, even though the gold and silver from the Americas was exponentially more money than ever had been seen in the world. Nevertheless, it's not enough. Philip II believed that God had told him that it was his job to bring everybody back to the proper way of, of, of praying. So he believed that Spain had to be a superpower in order to achieve this mission. Uh, all superpowers ultimately are destroyed by success. You become overconfident, you become arrogant, you become complacent, and that makes you weak. So there's a, there's a critical moment when you, you're at your peak. In the end, it was always pride and greed that came before a fall. The pride and greed that comes from being the best. Together with pride, intolerance enacted to preserve its own purity is also the poison chalice of great powers. But Athens never has the kind of back to citizenship the kind of expansive attitude that the Romans had. They did. Uh, and that was under their, that was a century before, uh, that was under their, one of their so-called tyrants. The first tyrants are not bad guys. They basically are the champions of the middle classes against the you know, aristocracy up there. And that tyrant, his name is Pisistratus, he is as well to compete now with other Greek cities, especially Corinth, because Athens was not the leading city in Greece at that time. We need to bring in talented people. He encouraged immigration. It's very interesting with the discussion we have in the US today, too. Uh, get people who can contribute something, people who have advanced technological degrees, people who can help us with innovation, give them special breaks for, for immigration. That's exactly what, uh, what that Athenian tyrant did. And then they attract a lot of people, and then the pendulum swings back. And the, uh, the Athenians say, now we uh, we really, now we really have to watch out. This is getting out of hand, and we want to have more. Uh, we want to have citizenship restricted. Fourteen ninety two is a very important date for the history of the Jews in Spain. Um, that started already earlier because uh, the uh, Christian kings uh, started to conquer I Islamic Spain. So from the north to the south, slowly the Spain was conquered by the Catholic uh, king uh, Ferdinand. Um, and uh, the, and as soon as the, the country became under Christian rule, the Jews were not welcome anymore. So they were really forced either to be baptized, so they had to become Christian, or they had to leave Spain. So in 1492, there was the edict of the expulsion. So there was really the law that either you had to be baptized as a Jew, or you had to leave the country. It was not allowed anymore to live as a Jew in Spain. So many Jews, most of the Jews left at that time. Many left for Portugal 
but also to all the countries around the Mediterranean Sea. In the Middle Ages, one of the roles, one of the professions of Jews, and not only in Spain, was the handling of money, the collecting of taxation, the organization of loans, the ability to supply armies, and this sort of thing. They had these particular talents. Um, without Spanish Jews, when Spain became a great empire, uh, the borrowing of money, which was necessary, became rather difficult. The collection of money, the control of spending, uh, the way that the uh, huge amounts of silver were wasted, silver came from America, were wasted, is often uh, thought to have been because partly there was the absence of these talented people. And uh, I think what you're talking about is very interesting. This becomes even more serious under the reign of Philip the third and fourth, which is early 17th century, where Spain is in great financial difficulties because it's trying to maintain great armies in Europe, particularly in Holland, where it's trying to keep the Dutch down because of rebellion, it's fighting England, it's making an armada, Philip, Philip, Philip II, because the armada, it's, it's trying to maintain the empire in America. That's terribly difficult. Very interestingly, in the 1620s, the a great, uh, we would say, call a prime minister, or the equivalent of a prime minister in Spain, the Count of Olivares, proposes that Jews, some Jews, should be allowed to return and live in Spain precisely for that reason. Yes, And interestingly enough, uh, there's a, a very interesting um, tendency. The Spanish treasury finds that they cannot borrow money anymore from the great financiers in Genoa, Florence and Italy. They won't lend money because of the debts. Let's be a little bit easier on these people. Let's keep the Inquisition off their backs. Let's release them. But it's not successful in the end. And in the end, the Inquisition is even more powerful than the need that the Spanish state has for these huge amounts of money. And of course, as you imply, the consequences that in the end, Spain goes bankrupt. And certainly, the Nazi empire was a failure. I argue that this is related to this politics of difference. An empire based on racial similarity, one race, is bound to fail. The Nazis were unable to use the strengths of the people that they conquered because they insisted on a, a racial empire. So this is a failure related directly to an extreme ideology of race likeness at the basis of empire. Japanese do not understand this. Japanese do not understand that if they would themselves be open immigrant policy, if they would have large numbers of smart computer, uh, skilled uh, engineering computer people, uh, merchant bankers, if they come into Japan and they're allowed to be Japanese, uh, Japanese uh, citizens, if they are allowed to have Japanese uh, passport if they want, this is smart for Japan. But Japanese say, no, we want single Japanese, uh, we want symbol, uh, s single Japanese ethnic group, single Japanese culture, so we do not want to have immigrants. So if you look over the past hundred years, you say, here is Japan and here is Great Britain. Both the same size, both are island nations. Uh, Japan has more skilled investment, more skilled industry nowadays, perhaps. But what its, its immigrant policy is, is a very intolerant immigrant policy. Uh, Great Britain doesn't perhaps have the manufacturing lead that Japan has, but Great Britain is an open society. So there are lots of people 
very smart people coming from India. So in the British in the British hospital system, almost a large number of the trained nurses in the system are coming from India or Kenya and East Africa. They have they go through very very intense competitive medical training and very intense examination and they are in now in British hospitals first class doctors and nurses from Bangalore from uh, Kenya who what is the why are, are the British wise you bet they are really wise because they have they have a large number of trained medical personnel in Great Britain. Great Britain has a wise immigration policy, brings in intelligent, highly intelligent people, and that strengthens Great Britain. Now, inside Great Britain, there are some political parties, there are union jack parties, there are proto-fascist parties who say, we do not like these immigrants. Too many Poles, too many Russians, too many Africans, too many Indians. We want to push them out. We want a pure English political ethnic group. Who is stupid here? It is the anti-immigrant party. In any country, if you are just knee-jerk nationalist against foreigners, because of their skin or their language or their culture. You are making bad decision. You are making decision like Philip II of Spain. Bad policy. Wise policy is can we have some more of your skilled people to come to us, please? Now. Let's look into the future. Many are saying that China will rise as a new hegemonic power in the 21st century. Could China really become the superpower to succeed the United States? And what are some crucial factors that China will have to address to achieve that? I think China is a superpower. I don't think it's a question. Uh, we're talking about a country which has the second largest economy in the world, uh, which is the first in the world in population, has a very dynamic economy, and we might add that it has a long-lasting imperial tradition, or it has a long-lasting traditions of ways to govern. So China as has at its disposal many tools and resources to remain a great power and to indeed expand its position in the world. I once spoke with uh, Li Kuan Yu and asked him whether he thought the United States would be passed by China in the 21st century. He said no, he said China can draw on the talents of 1.3 billion people, but the United States can draw on the talents of 7 billion people, in other words, the whole world. And what's more, it then recombines these people with a diversity which leads to more creativity than you get in the ethnically homogeneous uh, Chinese civilization. The United States uh, is well ahead of China. So I have no idea what will happen by the end of the century. I will not be around to find out. But uh, I think over the next uh, middle decades of the 21st century, the Americans will remain the largest power on all three dimensions of economic, military, and soft power. The question at the moment is, is China going to challenge America? And the simple answer is no. Um, they can't uh, economically, technically, um, they're simply not in the same league. China will be a very powerful player. Um, you know, in, East, in, a, in, in the Asia-Pacific region, China will be very, very strong. Um, how much power does China have in the Atlantic? Yeah, or the Arctic? Or the Mediterranean? Or the rest of Europe? Uh, or in North or South America? None whatsoever. 
China is not a superpower because it doesn't have a global reach. It's very powerful, but it's a regional player. If China is rising, this is my argument to you and to your readership, it has to be clever. It also has some weaknesses, some environmental weaknesses, some weaknesses with population balance inside China. So it has to take care of its weaknesses and have very clever foreign policy. So what means very clever foreign policy? It means don't do anything stupid right now. What is stupid, says Professor Kennedy? Stupid would be to go against Taiwan. It goes against Taiwan, it puts pressure upon Taiwan, it threatens Taiwan, it sends Chinese Navy around Taiwan to create blockade. Why is that stupid? Because Taiwan will resist, it will say to America, we have alliance with you, you must fulfill alliance, America will bring its aircraft carriers across the Pacific, it's, we're not talking yet about war, we're talking about international crisis, Taiwan crisis. And you open the paper and you say, perhaps China is going to war with Taiwan, what do you do? You call your currency trader and you say, get my money out of Wuhan, get it out of Wuhan as soon as possible. So Chinese currency tumbles without even going to war. That is stupid. If China has good leadership, good leadership is good neighbor leadership. Perhaps China in the future has long-term ambitions about Taiwan. Longer term, long, 50 years. Perhaps China wants to be number one power in Korean Sea, wants to be number one naval power in Western Pacific. 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. China wise policy is to wait because every year China gets a bit stronger economically, uh, gets more currency surplus, more trade surplus. Currency gets stronger. So wise China policy is do nothing. As China grows, Korea is once again becoming the focal point of great power rivalry. This is the hard, cold truth, whether we want it or not. So how should Korea navigate the net of great power interests? We turn to experts for advice regarding Korea's future. Korea is medium-sized country. It wants good relations with America and good relations with China. So Koreans will say, oh, please, please, in Washington and Beijing, will you be sensible? Don't have big antagonism because we are a medium-sized country in the middle. It, we get hurt if big guys go jumping around. There's an old saying in, in Africa, if the two elephants go stomping on the ground, the ground shakes also for us. So what is Korea's future to be? What's a wise policy for Korea? Keep investing in your education. Keep investing in your technology. Keep perhaps a surplus currency, but perhaps it shouldn't be so high. Perhaps you need to invest a bit more in smarter places in, say, Italian industry and Brazilian industry. That, in my view, would be smart. Always go for diplomacy. Do not let your Korean, uh, uh, Korean national interest be insulted, but always go for diplomacy. Medium-sized country always wants diplomacy. So in present day and uh, in, in the present uh, world, it is not acceptable to become a large country by conquering others, right? So hopefully Koreans don't want to go conquer a big chunk of the world. So that means again, so cooperation within Korea and then cooperation of Koreans with other uh, nations, uh, basically. And of course, you live in a diff difficult environment, right? So, uh, so well, and it doesn't have to be local cooperation anyway. But what I'm saying is that uh, smaller countries 
like Koreans, Koreas, they, uh, their best chance of having influence is through cooperating with other countries. And that's how you get your voice uh, heard. So, Korea is living in a world in many ways where the context is defined by China, by the United States, to some extent Russia. But in particular, with China and the United States as neighbors, we could say, it's very difficult to imagine a Korean imperial power, right? Uh, but states that have been in this position have been able to manipulate, under certain circumstances, um, both external powers or to see what they can gain from each of them. And those gains can be of different kinds. They can be economic gains. They can be gains of military protection. They can be the gains of mixing cultures and of knowledge. And so there are many positive qualities about being, if I can say it, a smaller power among great powers, particularly in the cultural realm. Do we want to increase tensions with uh, Tokyo, with Beijing? Professor Kennedy would say no. No, if you have tensions, then perhaps one of your political parties, which has a more conservative or more patriotic political culture, it will say, we stand strong for Korea, we build some more Korean uh, frigates or destroyers, and it, it makes us popular with some of the Korean population. It's probably good for internal political consumption, People like your government to be strong. People like to have strong navy. Usually, if you push it too far, that's stupid. The wise policy is to say, hey, we have disputes and disagreements with you. Let's wait another 10 years. Let's not do anything about it. Let's, let's postpone it, you know? Perhaps in the future, Korean diplomats and uh Japanese diplomats and Chinese diplomats can meet like in uh, Geneva or in London and we talk about our island disputes, our maritime disputes. Right now, it's stupid because if we are quarreling too much, what will happen to the markets? The markets will say, wow, is Korea having a big quarrel with Japan? That's not good. So we are going to sell Korean won and we are going to sell Korean currency and we are going to sell Japanese currency. So both Japan and Korea are hurting because they have nationalist quarrels. Message is good, smart leaders in Seoul. Yes, that's the message. Finish interview. Huh.